Hello, and welcome back to What the Health. I'm Julie Rovner, Chief Washington Correspondent for KFF Health News, and usually I'm joined by some of the best and smartest health reporters in Washington. But today we have a special episode for you all about health equity, taped before a live audience at the Texas Tribune Festival on September 6, 2024. I hope you enjoy it. We'll be back with our regular panel and all the news on September 12th. So here we go. I am pleased to be joined on this panel by two of my KFF Health News colleagues, Southern Bureau Chief Sabria Rice, who's right here next to me, and Midwest Correspondent Kara Anthony down at the end. We are also honored to be joined by two guests with a lot of combined expertise on this issue, Senate Democratic Leader Carol Alvarado, who represents the 6th District of Texas, which includes parts of Houston, and Dr. Ann Barnes, President and CEO of the Episcopal Health Foundation, also based in Houston. We're going to talk amongst ourselves for the next, I don't know, 40 minutes or so. Then we will go to you in the audience for your question. So go ahead and be thinking. Um, I have to say I am personally really excited about this episode because health equity is something I think about a lot, but I've never been able to accurately define, even for myself. I know it's about race and ethnicity and gender, but it's not just about race and ethnicity and gender. It's about income and wealth and class, but it's not just about income and wealth and class. It's about geography, but not just about geography. And it's about medical care, but not just about medical care. So I want to kick off this discussion by asking each of you how you define health equity. And why don't we just sort of go down the road? So we'll start with you, Sabria. Really great question and gave me a lot of things to think about. And I want to start with a little anecdote from something that happened yesterday evening. I was having a conversation with a group of visitors from South Africa who work for an investigative news site there called The Daily Maverick. And my colleague, Aniri Patani, who's also a KFF health news reporter, we were explaining some of the things about the U.S. healthcare system and just some basic stuff like how a lot of people can't afford to just go for preventive care, how you may or may not have access to care in your neighborhood and what that means in terms of your health outcomes. And in the middle, they pause us and they're like, wait a minute, wait a minute, this doesn't make any sense. We have these things in South Africa. It's something you hear regularly from other people um, who are visiting here. And they're like, but you're like the wealthiest country in the world. How do you not have these things? And I was thinking about that and thinking of in terms of your question. So for me, I think of uh, health equity as just creating the opportunity for everyone to be able to achieve their optimal health no matter their background. And I think that's something we could really work on in in the U.S. Great. When I think about health equity, I share a similar definition where folks have a just and fair opportunity to live their healthiest lives. Um, And this is largely from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's definition of health equity. But coupled with that is the requirement to dismantle barriers to health And so we have to remember that that is part of the equation, Um, not just dreaming that we all have optimal health, but thinking about how we're going to eliminate the barriers, especially for populations that are most vulnerable. I think about accessibility and affordability. And if you don't have those two things in healthcare, then you create this environment of the haves and the have nots, those who can afford to have health insurance and those who can't. Uh, maybe it's because of their, their job, their social economic status. And I also think that we have to take partisanship and politics out of healthcare. I mean, when did that become such a divisive issue that really reached the height during the Obamacare debate and the many, many times to repeal it? And I know we're going to dive into this a little bit more, but healthcare and access should never be political. When I think about health equity, I agree with all the panelists here today, but I'm also thinking about the future and the next generation. You know, I'm a single mom, I have a seven-year-old daughter, and I think about how is she going to be able to live a longer and healthier life than previous generations? You know, um, I'm going back home tomorrow, and one of the first things that I'm going to do is sign my daughter up for a swim lesson, right? That's health equity, because I'm also signing up for a a lesson as well. Why? Because I never learned to, to swim. It's about each generation doing better. And why did I learn to swim? Because my parents were born in 1948 in the South and did not have access to swimming pools. So so it's those daily practical applications that I think about when I think about health equity. So yeah. 
Senator Alvarado and Dr. Bruns, I want to talk about Texas a little bit, since obviously we're sitting here. Texas is, um, you know, we try not to think about just insurance when we talk about health equity, although it's a, a big deal. And in Texas, it's still a big deal, um, as opposed to a lot of other states. What impact does Texas, you know, failure to so far at least expand Medicaid have on health equity in this state? Well, you know, we know that health care and access to health care is critically important to health. It accounts for 20% of a person's health, and non-medical drivers account for the other 80%. But 20% is important. You know, we still have the highest rate of uninsured, so that means that there are parts of our community that can't get the preventive care that they need, that can't talk to people who might connect them to social services to support their non-medical needs. And so the larger conversation is about increasing health coverage overall in Texas, and certainly expansion of Medicaid is one piece of that. About 5 million people are uninsured right now in our state, and so we've got a lot of ground to cover. Affordable Care Act is one way, Medicaid expansion is another, and so a lot of work to do for sure. And I'll pick up where you left off. Medicaid expansion has been um, believe it or not, a, a hot political hot potato here in Texas. I've been filing, along with many of my colleagues, bills every session since 2009, maybe. We can't get hearings, and there, no one really gives you a good explanation why. They'll have things that uh, really don't make a lot of sense, that there are too many strings attached. Well, somehow, 40 other states don't have that problem. And we've seen that the cost that we're leaving on the table, millions of dollars. I think the last number I saw was 2023, maybe $11 billion, just there on the table. Other states are utilizing it. And then here in Texas, it's kind of complicated. I'll just give you the elevator <laughs> speech on that. But they kept the um, Medicaid enrollment going during the pandemic. And then afterwards, they did this winding, what they called winding down. <laughs> and almost 2 million people were left without Medicaid. And a good portion of that are children. And a good portion of those children are black and brown kids who are already living in environments where they don't have access to green space or uh, grocery stores, fresh fruits and vegetables. So you pile all of that together and that's why we are in this place of many uninsured, almost twice the number of the national rate, which is at eight, we're at 17. Yeah, everything's bigger in Texas, especially the number of uninsured. So, Dr. Barnes, I want you to talk about what it is that your foundation does, because I find it fascinating that even though you would think that you know, you're all about medical care, you're really not all about medical care, right? No, that's right. So um, we are committed to promoting equity by addressing health and not just healthcare. And so we use our resources in partnership with community members and organizations and change makers uh, to address factors that occur outside of the, the clinical setting and the doctor's office. And Representative Alvarado listed so many of them, housing, food security, employment, education. Um, all of these are critically important to health. And so we use our resources to help address those needs because we know that that will set people up for a healthy life and not just a sick life that ends them up in clinical care, you know, at the very tail end of their illness. One of the things um, I wanted to share, I'm a physician by training um, in internal medicine and primary care, and my patients taught me so much. When I saw them and I prescribed medicines for diabetes or high blood pressure, it was the stories about their lives outside of the clinic that really helped me understand what was impacting their health, um, which is why I got into this space of health and not just the clinical side. Kara, you're about to debut a project that you've been working on for four years that has to do with exactly this, with sort of the non-medical implications of other things and the lack of health equity. So why don't you tell us a little bit about it? 
Yeah, so coming up next week, we're going to premiere a new podcast, and also it's a documentary film called Silence in Sykeston. It focuses on police violence and police killings, but looking at them not as crime stories, but more as a public health threat. Also looking at the lynchings of yesterday as a public health threat. You know, maybe people people didn't use those terms back then, but certainly we recognize them as such now. And so I hope everyone checks this out because it really talks about how racism and chronic stress are linked, right? And so oftentimes it can weigh not only on your mental health, you know, anxiety, depression, you can become suicidal because of these things, but also you can have physical health effects as well, you know, higher rates of high blood pressure, cancer, etc. And so I've been traveling for the last four years to Sykeston, Missouri. It's a small community in rural Missouri where there was a man who was lynched there in 1942. His name was Cleo Wright. This is America's first federal federally investigated lynching. The first time the FBI decided to look at lynching as a federal crime, they came to Sykes in Missouri, but the story has never really been told and not in this way, not looking at it as a public health story because as public health reporters, you know, we're tasked with looking at what makes a community sick, you know, what's harming a community. And sometimes that can be something like lynching, something like police killings. And so we're looking at that head on and talking about the health impacts there. And Sabria, obviously, this is, this is a big project that we've been working on, but we've been working on a lot of other health equity stories that, that you're sort of in charge of. So why don't you tell us about some of those? Yeah, uh, certainly, and it's a great parallel to the work that Kara's been doing. I came to KFF uh, in 2022, and my charge was to start up a Southern Bureau and look at the health equity disparities that happen across the South. So my team ranges from you know, Texas to Florida up until like North Carolina. And we meet weekly and have conversations. And one thing I was constantly hearing from the reporters, um, I'm not a policy expert and I'm not a statistician, but I'm a people person and I listen to people. And my reporters were saying over and over again, yeah, we spoke to this expert about Medicaid expansion, but they were like, yeah, we could do that, but it's not going to stop the root of the problem, which is racism. Yeah, we wrote about maternal mortality or infant mortality, but still at the root of this is racism. So that term kept coming up, and so we decided this year to take a look at systemic racism in the healthcare system, and our series is called Systemic Sickness. And it looks at some of the things that uh, Kara talked about, including policing, but we also look at redlining or the history of redlining, of public housing challenges. We're looking, you know, uh, modern day, like a tax on uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion programs in education, specifically the field of medicine. So that's the nature of our project that we have uh, for this year, and it's been just a real fascinating experience. I think, you know, I've, I've heard this come up a couple of times in the panels we've had this morning about some of the other issues that really impact this in a bigger way than many people think, and I think housing is definitely one of those. Um, you talked about redlining. A lot of this is historic um, historic racism, and you know, in literal redlining, you cannot live here, or if you live here, you cannot get a mortgage. Um, there, there's been a lot of that. What, how, how significant, I assume, the problem is here in Texas? Yeah, it is significant, and a lot of those racist structures, uh, we continue to experience the after effects of those even today. Those neighborhoods are still under-resourced. And that includes, like you mentioned, grocery stores, safe spaces to play, green spaces, good transportation options. And so those old and I suppose acceptable forms of structural racism uh, that were enacted are still playing out today in the health of people. It's very important and you know housing doesn't get a lot of attention it's not a very you know glamorous or sexy issue but I'm glad to hear presidential candidate Kamala Harris she talked about housing and what she would like to see to build more affordable housing or it's, I guess we're calling it workforce housing now and then our state comptroller Glenn Hager you know recognizing how many people we have moving to Texas all the time and to accommodate that we need about 300,000 new uh, units or housing. So, you know, people don't have a place to lie their head that's comfortable and a place to cook meals. And then if they don't have those, those safety nets, then their last concern is probably, oh, am I getting my workout in today? Or am I eating enough fruits and vegetables when they're in survival mode? 
And I'll piggyback on what Representative Alvarado said. It's hard for people to see how this kind of plays out in real time. And uh, two of our reporters on the Southern team just recently looked at a community in Savannah, Georgia called Yamakra Village. It's a public housing community that started around World War II. And historically, at that time, the residents were white. Uh, disinvestment happened within this community over the years and the population of the community changed. So now it's a predominantly black and Latino community. But what you see is very a large amount of disinvestment. Um, people can't get things fixed, right? So you're living in very unhealthy housing when you do have housing. There's no playgrounds. There's no green space. There's an extreme amount of violence. But one man uh, told our reporters, the walls sweat like working men. This person moved into this community uh, and got vouchers to be able to live there and immediately developed asthma and has been taking medication even years after he left the community. So when you think about kind of how the system is harming people, these communities are there and they're not being invested in. Instead, people are given things like Section 8 if they can get the vouchers. And then if you can find affordable living that will take your Section 8 voucher. Um, so it's a, it's a really big problem and housing is often not talked about as a public health crisis. No, absolutely. And not just the place that you lay your head, but high quality housing, not substandard, that actually can impact your health. One of the things we've seen, um, I guess, in the last couple of years are these extraordinarily hot summers. Um, and I know, you know, we've always, the, the government has always helped underwrite heating assistance in the winter, um, but apparently air conditioning assistance is not considered of the same importance. I just read Phoenix has been 100 degrees every day for the last 100 days. Um, I know that, that here in Texas, you know, you've had some pretty extended heat waves. I mean, how big an issue is heat? as a public health and equity issue. It's a big problem, and especially when we've had things like power outages, uh, our storms that we had very close to one another. We had um, the derecho in May, and then we had followed by the Hurricane Burl, and um, that was tough. I mean, people were out of power anywhere from a couple of days to 10 days. And some, for some, it's life or death, especially if they have medical equipment that they have to be hooked up to. We're going to be tackling some of those issues in this session, but our city does a good job in our county of opening cooling centers so that people have a place to go and retreat and um, charge their, their uh, devices. But the weather is getting uh, much more turbulent. The, the uh, summers are getting hotter. The hurricane season is more active. And until people realize that there's, there's a reason all this is happening and people don't want to talk about it or put policy in for, forth that addresses what's, ha what's taking place in our environment. So they, they go hand in hand. One of the other things as we talk about communities where there isn't investment is that there are these heat islands and typically they are where people are low income, uh, communities of color, where simple things like trees being planted that could cool the, the temperature in the area, these neighborhoods don't have those amenities. So there are efforts in Texas um, and in Houston to, to try to green up uh, some of those communities, but it requires investment and attention and acknowledging that that we have these disparities across yeah, there, the community. There was a study, I think it was in Baltimore a couple of years ago, where the temperature differential was like 15 degrees. I mean, it would be 85 in the suburbs and it would be 100 in some of these sort of concrete jungles downtown where the buildings hold on to the heat. And of course, those are places where people live and often can't afford uh, their utilities. And obviously their utility bills would be higher because it's gonna cost more to, to cool those places. Um, and as Representative Alvarado mentioned, heat when you have chronic conditions, so the elderly in particular, um, these are the communities that have the greatest burden of those conditions. Um, and so it's, it's particularly alarming that need is there and we really have to pay attention to it. One of the things we just looked at in a story was this idea of energy poverty. And um, one interesting factoid that I learned from that that I was unaware of myself is the idea that 
uh, many of our federal policies tend to focus on cold weather um, and that this idea like and federal and state so for example in North Carolina where the story was centered there are requirements that apartments and other kind of housing uh, that they mandate that you have um, heat in the winter it's not the same for AC in the summer and that's probably something that should be looked at. Uh, I want to talk about women. When we talk about health equity, sort of differences between men and women uh, were one of the first sort of places we saw before the Affordable Care Act, insurers were allowed to charge women more simply because they were women and they lived longer and, you know, had more health expenses associated with being pregnant and having children. That was eliminated, but obviously there are still a lot of inequities between men and women, and it's there. I know that they are exacerbated by race, but it's not purely race. I mean, how big an issue is this still? Obviously, you know, reproductive health in general, abortion in specific, is the central health issue in this year's campaigns. So, so where does it fall in sort of the pantheon of health equity? I think if we had more women elected to office, definitely in Texas and in statewide positions, that things like Medicaid would pass, expansion of Medicaid. And it does matter who is at the table, who is making the decisions, who's, and this happened just on one side of the aisle, but just 12 month postpartum for women so that they can take advantage of Medicaid and uh, it finally got done. But that's the only piece that we've been able to do. And there were two women, Democrat and Republican, Tony Rose and Senator Huffman, who led that effort. And I just know if we had more women in the right places, that issues like health care wouldn't be so partisan and divisive. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. We finally got 12 months of coverage um, postpartum. And it's really unfortunate that we have to piecemeal the care that women need. I think about the fact that we expect good pregnancy outcomes when someone hasn't had care until they're pregnant, and up until recently, only eight weeks after they were pregnant. And so, yeah, there are a lot of disparities. And for many women, you know, being pregnant is their ticket to Medicaid. And so it just perpetuates this fragmented um, continuum of a health and women are falling out of it regularly. And especially with women of color, 64% of Latinas and 62% of African-American women will at some point be on Medicaid. I just want to chime in here too. You talk about reproductive rights. I considered Julie writing a personal essay about at the time I was 35, I went on birth, I'm I'm only 37 now, but as a black woman in the US going on birth control for the first time in my life. Now I mentioned I'm a single mom, right? So that wasn't always my story, but I think we're in an era of progress and education that is still really, really important. So I just wanted to share that. So I want to talk a little bit about the actual inequities within medical care. One of the things, um, Stat News has a wonderful story that's part of a series. They're starting this week on algorithms that are Im- embedded into care when for when doctors are you know make a diagnosis and then the algorithm comes up and shows all the things you should consider in deciding what kind of treatment. Um, and a lot of these now have is the patient black or uh, you know or and some of them. I think were originally, I assume most of them were originally born out of some sort of thought that there's a differential in risk depending on skin color, but obviously a lot of them are now have been completely overturned by science and yet they're still there. Um, What impact does sort of embedded racism in medicine in general have on health equity? Yeah, specific to, to that in particular, what it resulted in is individuals who had evidence of risk because they were black there was a higher threshold that had to be crossed before they got additional testing or additional treatment which means that there are populations of people who didn't get timely care because of those embedded algorithms one of the other things there's not an overriding body i guess cms could be that overriding body but right now no one is standing up saying absolutely you cannot use race based algorithms and so it's really up to individual health systems states could implement penalties if you use them but right now it's up to an individual institution 
and it takes a lot to undo an algorithm and change an electronic medical record, but we are at the threshold, I think, of that beginning to happen. Yeah, and it's such a common issue. I spent the last few years looking particularly at kidney disease testing, right? And if you uh, put a black person's kidney on a table and you put a white person's kidney on the table, you would not be able to tell the difference. Like people really need to understand that race and biology are not the same, right? But for years, I mean, decades, people have mixed this up and it has delayed care from people who are not getting the treatment that they need. You know, we wrote a story a couple of years ago about a black man who needed a kidney. A white woman read the story and decided to donate a kidney to him, but that's not everybody's, you know, case. You know, I can only write about so many patients that, you know, are in that same scenario. And so there's a, still a lot of work that needs to be done, but progress is being made. The hospital in particular that we were looking at in St. Louis, they've made some policy changes since we published that particular article. So, uh, but we still have a long way to go. I can't say that enough. Race and biology are not the same. I mentioned at the top geography, um, and you know, when we talk about sort of people who are grouped together because they have to be, but it's also about where people decide to live in rural versus urban. I mean, how can we sort of look? population-wide and try to even out. I mean, we talk constantly about the closures of rural hospitals and the difficulty of getting care in far-flung areas, and obviously Texas has a lot of far-flung areas, <laughs> I know. Um, that, 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 that is another issue that sort of plays into this whole thing, right? Oh, absolutely. And one of the arguments, again, this all keeps going back to Medicaid expansion, but you're talking to my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, I said, your districts, some of your rural districts are suffering the most. Hospitals have shut down. They have to drive to the next big city. It might be you know, Houston or Dallas or San Antonio. But it has, I think, dis disproportionately hurt rural areas. And until folks want to own that, embrace that, and try to fix it, we're gonna continue to be in this place and probably the, the gap will widen even more. And I'd say we, we saw this kind of play out in Georgia this week. I live in Atlanta and there was the unfortunate school shooting incident that happened there. And the community that that school is in had no hospital in that area. So the closest place would have been 40 miles away in either directions to Athens, Georgia, which is about 40 miles from the Barrow County and then Atlanta. So even in an incident like that, just coordinating to get uh, people treatment in a major incident uh, is just another example of like why we why we need to do something <laughs> right like it's not just black communities or Hispanic communities I think it's all of us and any given moment may need access to care and if you think about it in light of that like 40 miles is no easy feat on Atlanta highways <laughs> in rush hour traffic or even being airlifted it's still a distance and you have a small window of time to save a life yeah, and there's been um, specific conversations in Texas about access to maternal health care in rural communities. And so again, the distance that someone would have to drive is, is hard for many of us to imagine, um, especially in a time of crisis. One of the other sort of continuing issues when we talk about health equity is the desire of people to be treated by people who look like them or people who are, you know, have similar backgrounds to them. Um, that's obviously been an issue for years that the medical, you know, community has been trying to deal with. Um, I want to ask sort of specifically what impact the Supreme Court's decision banning affirmative action is going to have on the future of the medical workforce. Um, and the, the, the few strides that have been made to get more people of color uh, into not just into medical school, but into practice. I'd say that was pretty immediate. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and especially in some of our southern states, given the history, but I think there were immediate bans on DEI programs or uh, dismantling of those at, at schools across the south. I can think of Alabama, Mississippi, Texas, <laughs> um, 
uh, even Georgia introduced a bill it didn't pass but I think we saw that happen pretty immediately and the doctors that at least reporters on my team have spoken to have said even in their programs they can't even say we're trying to increase like the number of black doctors or Hispanic doctors or Native American doctors like you can't target those groups to come to special programs to um, have access to visitations to schools or that sort of thing you can't even say it so they're having to kind of circumvent how they reach people um, to increase the low numbers of doctors of these ethnic groups. I think we've only begun to see the, the consequences that have taken place because of that. When you, you mentioned the medical center, we have people that come from all over the world and having physicians that they can relate to or just you know speaking the language. 48% of people from Houston speak other languages other than English at home. So Houston is known for being very international, very diverse, and it's only going to continue to grow. So having the you know, language barrier also contributes to many other issues regarding your health. But having that comfort with someone that understands your background, may understand your, your challenges, that's important. And I don't think that the people who were coming up with DEI legislation, you know, here in Texas, and that's, those things don't cross their mind because they're, they're short-sighted. They're trying to check a box or get that A-plus on their whatever scorecard by whatever group in their party. But people think, well, a doctor is a doctor is a doctor. Why does it matter if that doctor, you know, if you're able to relate to that doctor? How important is it really to have a medical community that looks like the community it's serving? Yeah, I would say it's a it's a huge trust issue. You know, I remember having patients in my practice, um, African American patients, and there was a wonderful trust that that we had with one another. And then I would refer them to a specialist who didn't look like them, and they would ask me questions. Do you really think they're going to do the procedure that they said? And I was just thinking, oh my gosh, you know, I I'm taking for granted that that someone would trust me. And when we think about how we make recommendations to patients, if the trust isn't there, why would they listen to what you had to say? And then that will, of course, put you at a disadvantage from a health perspective. And in terms of eliminating affirmative action, I don't know the medical school data, but a lot of higher education institutions are already reporting lower numbers um, in, their, in their incoming classes, and that certainly is going to be the same in, in medical schools, nursing schools, I PA schools. I did have in my notes that, that medical schools are freaked out by this. Yeah. Yeah. And it's Absolutely. really, and what you're talking about, and I've written a lot about this topic, and just to name it, we're talking about culturally competent care. And culturally competent care is really, really hard to find because the numbers are low, because there has been a shift. But I think the conversation is also shifting towards culturally humble care or cultural humility in healthcare. So even if I can't find a doctor who looks at me, I need someone who's culturally humble to say, you know what, I don't understand everything that you're going through as a black woman raising a child in America. But I, I can admit that, I can say that out loud, and I can maybe direct you towards someone who can be more helpful, or maybe we could just have a really candid conversation about that. And so I just want to kind of give some people that the, the terminology that I think could be useful if you want to learn more. We also just did a uh, story looking at colorism in the U.S. and the impact that that has on people. Interviewed a woman, for example, who had been bleaching her skin for all of these years, had like uh, these side effects from that. But clinicians weren't catching it. They didn't know um, like to look for specific things. So there were mental health challenges there because of like feeling uh, unhappy being in her own body. Uh, but there were also manifestations on her physical health because the chemicals that she was introducing were causing harm. So I think, yeah, that kind of cultural competence, someone that looked like her and could relate to her background might be like, wait a minute, is this what's happening here? And that's what happened in the case of that particular patient. So at our session this morning on why does care cost so much, my colleague Noam Levy talked about something he calls a culture of greed in healthcare. Um, it does seem as if every aspect of the system is or has been monetized. I mean, it really is all about the money. How does that impact health equity? I mean, you, you could think that if the incentives were in the right place, it might be able to help. 
And it, it drives up the cost of insurance, too. Uh, I mean, if you've ever have a loved one in the hospital they don't want you to bring your medications from home so you have to take what they have there and it's, it's the same thing but you know it's very expensive you know what you can, Advil you can buy a bottle of Advil for five six bucks each pill is about that much so it and then it you know drives up in cost of insurance and it just uh, it has an economic impact that trickles down to the consumer and then it becomes a barrier right so if you are paying out of pocket and things are incredibly expensive and you also have to buy food and pay your rent you may forego or delay care which again is going to leave you in a worse situation from a health standpoint and just perpetuate uh, the disparities. You know, now we have managed care companies who serve not just m most of the Medicare population, but most of the Medicaid population, um, who get paid for, you know, presumably the incentive there was, you're going to take care of these people and we're going to pay you, and the more people you can find to take care of, the more we're going to pay you. And in theory, they have adequate networks where people can actually find care, which is not always the case with Medicaid. It's hard to, to find providers who will take Medicaid. I've started seeing ads for managed care companies for people who are eligible for both Medicare and Medicaid, the dual eligibles. They don't call them that, but it's like, wow, I'm looking at TV ads for dual eligibles. Somebody must be making some amount of money um, off of these people. Is anything good coming from it? I mean, the pharmaceutical companies are raking it in pretty good. <laughs> and in some countries, you can't even have direct promotion for pharmaceuticals from the pharmaceutical company to the consumer. Most the, other countries. Yeah, except, I mean, every commercial, I mean, you pick your drug, what is it? Skyrizi or Cialis, whatever. I mean, it's <laughs> it's out there. Yes, we all know the name of the drugs everybody. now. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn it over to questions in a minute, but before I do, I don't want this to be a complete downer, so I would like each of you to talk about something that you've seen in the last year or two that's made you optimistic about being able to at least address the issue of health equity. I mean, the fact that we're having these conversations more, <laughs> I think, is some, something that brings optimism for me. I don't remember my family having these conversations as a, as a kid. It was just like, well, this is just the way it is, or this is how the system is. And I think it's positive that we're having conversations, not just about how the system is currently, but about changing it, as uh, Kara mentioned, for the next generation. As a philanthropy, I can talk about some specific investments that we've made that have allowed community health workers to work with women throughout their pregnancy period. And so in a small way for those women, we have increased the opportunity for them to have a healthy outcome. Um, but we've also done some policy work. We were part of a large coalition of folks pushing for 12 months of Medicaid coverage postpartum. And those system level changes um, affect millions of Texans. And so again, we felt that was really an important way to change the health equity equation. And thank you for your work on that. Uh, many of us on my side of the aisle have been filing those bills to get, get it extended to 12 months. But you know, again, everything goes back to politics. They weren't gonna let somebody in the minority party carry it. And at that point, you don't care who gets the credit, just get it done. Or as we say in Texas, get her done. And, uh, and take care of folks. But another thing that we've been talking about on our side of the aisle was the, the tampon tax, the pink tax. And wow, all of a sudden, my colleagues on the other side thought, oh, that's, that's a good idea. And so anyway, we didn't get to carry it. They passed it. Okay, it's done. So, you know, we've got to play this, this game, dance this dance here, and, and we'll do it. The, the most important thing is to make things accessible and affordable to people. And one of the other things, too, we didn't get to talk about this much, but when you talk about the environment and health impacts, my district has a, uh, so many concrete batch plants. And so we're, we're seeing more people become aware of particulate matter and the negative impact that these um, facilities have. And they're almost all, I'd say 99%, all located in African-American and Latino neighborhoods. And Harris County has the largest number of concrete batch plants in any other county in Texas. And a third 
of those concrete batch plants are walking distance to schools and to daycares. We have more work to do in this area, but at least now the public is, is holding people accountable and we're putting more pressure on the agencies that regulate these facilities. We often think about data and there's negativity associated with that. But one thing that I've learned, particularly in the last four years, is that there's good data too. There's change that is happening, right? You know, I mentioned early on in our conversation about the swim lesson with my daughter, and, and that's progress, right? There's there's pro institutional change happening as well. You know, um, we talk about the algorithms and the issues there, but we know that there are institutions that have said yes. We, this is a mistake, you know, I have concerns and this is another conversation about what's going to happen with AI, <laughs> but, you know, I think that there are positive ways to look at that as well. So change is happening and, you know, we have to think about also moving forward and we want to tell those stories too. All right, well, I'm going to turn it over to the audience now. I see we already have someone waiting to ask a question. Please, before you ask your question, tell us who you are and where you're from and please make it a question. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Abimisola. I am from Nigeria, but I live in Austin, Texas. Um, my question is about education. I feel like a big part of access and equity is education. So what are we doing to let people know that there are some services that are available to help them access the care that they need? Like I imagine that as I guess working through the pandemic, health literacy is not really a thing in the public. And so what are we doing to let people know that some of these services exist and then also on the cultural humility end of things what are we doing to make sure that providers are aware of this like gap and how can they be helpful in their own way to make sure that equitable care does exist when people come in so i think that we at, are at a moment of awakening um, when it comes to recognizing that you need trusted messengers in communities to actually engage in conversations about navigating healthcare systems or engaging in preventive health measures. Community health workers are really starting to have their day, and there is recent legislation that will actually allow them to be reimbursed for case management services related to their care of pregnant women. And so we're, we're in a moment, um, that same legislation will also cover doulas um, and their case management services. But I think to your point, education, health literacy, having someone you trust who can walk you through that process is so critically important. And, and it's those caregivers are finally getting the recognition that they deserved and being elevated and reimbursed. And so I think that that is a, a great step. Hello, thank you for the information that you provided. So I'm Linda Jackson, and I'm with Houston Tillerson University, which is a historically black university a few miles from here. And I wanna talk about the speed. One thing that happened again during the coronavirus is that because the university had systems in place, for example, the university was able to move from on on campus, on ground to online almost immediately with all of those funds and programs that were available. We're in that same situation now with what's ex what we're experiencing now. We have an increase in the number of students who want to attend college, an increase in our enrollment. We are a pipeline for the health industry, for some of the issues that we have to deal with. But the issue is that we can move quickly, but to get to all of those entities that are out there that can provide the funding that's needed. We have students we turned away who are waiting to get into college, and they're interested in computer science, and they're interested in the healthcare industry, and they're interested in all those fields, but it's the speed. We're here waiting, but the speed for which all of those resources have to come into place. And for example, we, uh, we had entities who came to us with a doula program, with a doula idea, and we offer a certificate in the doula program to ensure that there are more doulas to provide that culturally sensitive care. And so, so my question is, we're here, we're waiting, we, the resources need to come faster. And so I guess that's a statement as opposed <laughs> to a question. <laughs> but thank you for raising the topic. I will just say, well, first off, my mother and my aunt are both graduates of Houston Tillerson, so very excited to have you here. Um, I think connecting the industries 
that need the workforce with the institutions who can provide the training is a key connection that we haven't figured out how, how, to, how to do well because that's where your resources would come to be able to support students getting trained to then fill the jobs where we have needs in the healthcare setting. And this is not just a health equity issue. This no. is the entire health system writ large. The, Absolutely. The difficulties with finding, with matching workforce needs with patient needs. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for this lively conversation. My name is Robert Lilly. I am a criminal justice participatory defense organizer with grassroots leadership and I'm also justice impacted, formerly incarcerated, 54 years old with 21 years of my life spent in some institution or another. I want to just comment, or not comment, but inquire uh, from the two points that were made about equity. You mentioned that you wanted to, uh, equity was about optimal health no matter the background of the individual, and also to eliminate barriers, especially for populations that are most vulnerable. Texas has over 110 prisons, 135,000 people currently incarcerated, 600,000 every year exiting the system. Medicaid expansion is a challenge in Texas. My question before you is, in this era of mass incarceration, what options do we have? If policy can't fix this problem, what other options exist? With the creative minds that you have, the thoughtful insights that you're gaining from your research and, and, and reflection, how can you advise us to move if our legislature won't move? Do we depend on them alone to solve these problems? Or is there an alternative route that supersedes them? And the last thing I'll ask is, how much of what we're experiencing today, and we know America's been historically racist, but how much of what we're experiencing is a backlash to George Floyd? All excellent questions. Somebody want to take them on? I really think about you know, if policy can't do it, what can? And that's where I think about the, for me, often it's the institution of the black family and starting young, what conversations do we need to have with our children, you know, as we move forward? Uh, that's one thing that I in particular think about because I really think it comes down to literacy, education, being made aware and also thinking about what can we do as individuals, but it really requires institutional change. I don't wanna you know, act like that's not you know, at the core of the issue, but really wanna talk about our, our future a lot and think about our future a lot. And so um, I think it starts at a really young age. I wish we could tackle the whole iceberg all at once and just tear the whole thing down and start over. <laughs> but the reality is we have to chip at it, right? And I think as we continue to do that, I think it, it starts to dismantle. And I don't know that that offers much hope, but I think it's kind of where we're at and what we have to do uh, is to keep moving because we wouldn't have had this progress without that kind of fight. But I, I no, go ahead. Okay. And vote. <laughs> Um, hi, y'all. My name is Carly Deardorff, born and raised in Texas. I have lived in Texas my whole life, except I ran away to Spain for a little bit. Born in Lubbock, been in Austin for about 15 years now. I want to say one, thank you so much for your question previously. My question involves both formerly incarcerated, but also aging. So aging parents, aging families. My partner and I were both raised by single moms. And so the outcomes for them health-wise and also financially in terms of retirement and things like that are very, very slim. And so now in this next phase of life, navigating equity and health outcomes for them, it's really scary um, because I don't know. So whew, before I cry, um, what do y'all have as opportunities and resources as you help someone age and what that can look like in this space of life? So thank you for being so vulnerable and talking about how incredibly challenging navigating the healthcare system and the um, systems that address non-medical factors are for individuals. I don't have an easy answer. There are organizations and some that we have funded that provide navigation services so that folks who know how to walk their way through these complicated systems can be helpful um, and maybe we can talk offline after we're done. Again, they, they rely on trusted messengers in the communities um, who know what's going on um, in the environment and then can actually help 
with the complicated side of things um, as well. And I think that's probably the best bet for traversing something that doesn't have to be as complicated as, as it is, but it is what it is at this point. Do we have time for one more? We do. Perfect. Go ahead. So Mir Jamani, I work as a public health policy advisor <clears throat> to Commissioner Adrian Garcia, Harris County Precinct 2, Senator Alvarado's district, and Precinct 2 overlap a ton. But Precinct 2 has approximately 1.1 million constituents, of which 65% are Hispanic. We also have some of the most vast health disparities, ranging from the highest mortality rate to the lowest home ownership rate. We touched on that, amongst others. And despite launching programs ranging from free community-based clinics to lead abatement programs, we, we see a trend that these are most underutilized by the most vulnerable populations. So my question is, can you speak to what measures can be taken or what folks are not doing to change the mindset of these populations from a curative mindset to a preventative mindset? I think it's, as you mentioned before, trust, <laughs> right? Those community navigators and making sure they're out there getting, you know, giving voice to the community and and sharing kind of what resources are there. During COVID, um, there was a community in Northeast Georgia with a large immigrant population. And they actually ended up having some of the lowest rates of COVID for the state because of those community navigators. They really hit the ground and it was kind of amazing what they did, going door to door if they had to, uh, having weekly events and having conversations, making screenings accessible to everyone and having navigators that spoke various different languages. I think those kind of things continue to help with uh, that kind of outreach. I totally agree. And acknowledging painful history, too. I think we have to realize, it's like, who is tasked to do the, the fixing? And are we really giving agency and empowering those that, that need help the most? Um, I'm thinking about particularly in Sykeston, Missouri, where the police chief tried to institute a program where people were to come, black, particularly black residents in town, were going to, he wanted to have meetings with them and have conversations, but it, it just didn't take off. But part of the reason why is because of the level of mistrust, but also some acknowledgement of the history of racial violence that had gone on in the past in that community that people were still trying to heal from today. So I think that there's so much work that has to be done in institutions. Uh, one of the first steps that they can take is acknowledging painful history as a way to move forward because we have to acknowledge our pain to have some joy too. I think that's a wonderful place to leave it. I want to thank our panel so much, and thank you to the audience for your great questions. I, I hasten to add, if you enjoyed the podcast, you can subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. We'd always appreciate it if you left us a review. That helps other people find us, too. Special thanks, as always, to our technical guru back in Washington, D.C., Francis Ying, and our editor, Emery Hudeman. And thanks to the kind folks here at TribFest for helping us put this all together. Uh, we'll be back in D.C. with our regular panel and all the news on September 12th. Until then, everyone be healthy. Thank you.